ladies and gentlemen, please find your way to your seats. Our program is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome former ABC News anchor, Sam Donaldson. Thank you, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this morning's program. Uh, you know, there are dates that all of us have that are very personal, uh, and there are dates that we have as a country that we all share. In my lifetime, uh, December 7th, 1941, November 22nd, 1963, 9-11, these are three terrible dates for the country. And then there's November 9th, 1989, good news, the fall of the Berlin Wall, presaging the end of the Soviet Union. And it's a subject that we're gonna to discuss today. How did it happen? What are the consequences? Who did this? Who knew? For a look at what's in store for us this morning, it's a pleasure to welcome Andrew Card, who served in three administrations, with the Ronald Reagan as Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, with George Herbert Walker Bush, the Treasury Secretary, no, not the Treasury, Secretary of Transportation, and with George W. Bush, he was the White House Chief of Staff. Andrew Card. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, I'm honored to be here. We're very grateful for Georgetown University and the School of Foreign Service for helping to host this, the Atlantic Council. And we're also grateful for the Reagan Foundation and their institute for helping to host this event. Uh, we have many, many people here who should be introduced. And I'm not gonna ask everyone to stand who is important. <laughs> And I'm not going to ask everyone to sit who is important so that other more important people can stand. <laughs> I am here to say that uh, we're proud to have Dorothy Bush Cook here, the president's daughter. <laughs> and Ellie Sosa, his granddaughter. We also have folks from the Atlantic Council here. And Fred. Uh, British Robinson is here from the Barbara Bush Literary Literacy Foundation. We also have the EU Deputy Head of Delegation, Michael Curtis here. And the German Deputy Chief of Missions, uh, Richlief Boyton, is here. <laughs> this is a remarkable day because we're remembering a truly remarkable event. Uh, I am about to introduce someone who I have the greatest respect for. Above all, I know three absolutes about the speaker that I will introduce. First, the world changed profoundly when he was Secretary of State under President George H.W. Bush. As freedom and democracy began to spread around the globe, the Cold War ended peacefully. Germany was reunited as a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and the Soviet Union imploded. At the same time, Today's speaker assembled the international coalition that ejected Saddam Hussein's troops from Kuwait 
orchestrated the Madrid Conference where Israel and all its Arab neighbors discussed peace for the very first time and negotiated nuclear arms reduction treaties with the Soviet Union and then Russia. All of that happened after he had served President Ronald Reagan as one of our nation's best secretaries of the Treasury and before then as White House Chief of Staff, a position for which he is still considered to be the gold standard. Reciting his many achievements could take a long time, but I'm mindful of the speaker's second absolute. He always asks that his introductions of him be short. Which leads me to the third absolute, which is, of course, that when this gentleman asks you to do something, it's best that you do it. <laughs> I was honored to be asked by him to do something and serve President Ronald Reagan, and it brought me to Washington, D.C. And so I am proud and honored to introduce a great American, one of America's most remarkable leaders, and I'd like you to welcome the 61st U.S. Secretary of State, the Honorable James A. Baker III. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Andy, for that over-the-top uh, introduction. Thank you as well, Andy, for your many, many contributions to this nation. You've been an exemplary public servant, and the country appreciates it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first collaboration between four institutions that I greatly admire for their excellence in preserving the past and in advancing public policy. The George and Barbara Bush Foundation, the Ronald Reagan Foundation, the Atlantic Council and Georgetown University all represent the very, very best in their respective fields. I am confident that today's lessons from the fall of the Berlin Wall will be an informative and useful examination of an historic event that led to the peaceful conclusion of the Cold War. What happened three decades ago this week fundamentally changed the world. Since then, when I'm asked which American president was responsible for the end of the Cold War, I typically have replied that it was all of those American presidents. Democrats and Republicans alike, from Harry Truman through George H.W. Bush, each of them was firmly committed to a free and undivided Europe. But as someone who served in one capacity or another for four of those presidents, I hope you can understand why today I want to add that some Cold War presidents were more directly involved than others. Ronald Reagan's soaring rhetoric became etched in the hearts and minds of people around the world who desired freedom. Who, after all, can forget that picture of the Gipper at the Brandenburg Gate when he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And so, two years after that historic speech, the wall did come down on November 9, 1989. As momentous as that occasion was, President Bush 41 understood that the Soviet Union remained a distinct and potent global security threat. Rather than stick it in the eye of his Soviet counterparts, President Bush eschewed triumphalism in favor of clear-eyed diplomacy. As a result, 11 months after the wall came down, Germany was reunited peacefully as a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization over the objections, I might add, of some of our allies and, of course, the Soviet Union. And shortly thereafter, the 45-year Cold War ended with a whimper rather than with the nuclear bang that we had all feared, as the Soviet Union itself was dissolved. And so today, our nation's leaders confront their own unique set of international challenges, 
And as we commemorate the 30th anniversary of the fall of that Berlin Wall, I think it is instructive to recall three factors that both Presidents Reagan and Bush kept in mind as seismic changes were underway in Europe and around the world. First, both understood that domestic support is critical for the successful implementation, I would say formulation and implementation of foreign policy. A foreign policy that does not have domestic political support will not last very long. Unless Americans back the decisions of their presidents, those policies are doomed to wither and eventually fail. Presidents Reagan and Bush both knew that they would be more successful if they had the broad backing of the American people, and they both crafted bipartisan foreign policies accordingly. Secondly, international support, of course, is also critical. Both President Reagan and President Bush realized that a large component of American strength was that we were the promoter and champion of a liberal world order that revolved around open markets, multilateral institutions, and liberal democracy. Allies mattered. They still do. And Pax Americana in those days was their North Star. And third, both of those presidents understood the importance of deft, thoughtful, and sustained diplomacy. Both developed strong relations with other foreign leaders, particularly Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev, German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, and others. Those relationships nurtured trust between countries and helped them reach pragmatic solutions. In the end, of course, no one individual was responsible for the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War. Every American president since Truman played indispensable roles. But above all else, it was the enduring spirit of the citizens of the captive nations that finally tipped the scales toward freedom. The lessons that Presidents Reagan and Bush provided during that critical window of history remain as pertinent today as they were back then. And so, as our nation continues to confront many daunting challenges, the foreign policies of Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush remain models that all American presidents would do well to follow as they seek to promote America's interests and values around the world. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Secretary Baker. I'm delighted that you've agreed to spend a few more minutes with us. Uh, if you just have a seat, I'll call you back shortly. To wait for the call. What power, I thought it would never have this with this gentleman. <laughs> Reporters want to be where the action is, where a good story is there for the telling. Sometimes careful preparation brings that about. Other times it just happens unexpectedly, as on the day that Ronald Reagan gave a humdrum speech at the Washington Hilton, came out past the rope line, and suddenly was met with a spray of bullets from a young man who was standing five and a half feet away from me. I'd rather not have had that good story. Well, when it comes to this great story that we are revisiting today, there was one, only one American television journalist on the scene when the Berlin Wall began to crumble. Tom Brokaw, the anchor and managing editor of the NBC Nightly News. He was in Berlin on a different assignment, but as he tells it, just fell into one of the biggest stories of the world which he owned. Here is some of Brokaw's reporting that night from the Berlin Wall. <laughs> 
It was a night when the world changed right before our eyes. Good evening, live from the Berlin Wall on the most historic night in this wall's history. The Berlin Wall was such a fixed part of our lives, and it was such a physically imposing barricade. It was so much uglier and so much more oppressive than people realized from just seeing it on television. When you went to it personally, it was appalling. And Ronald Reagan had gone there. Mr. Gorbachev teared down this wall. And John Kennedy had gone there. Ich bin ein Berliner. So even with all the turmoil that was going on, it seemed unlikely that that wall, which was at once such a solid image of oppression, would come down in some fashion. And then in a heartbeat, it did. I was the only journalist on the air the night the Berlin Wall came down. I owned that story, and uh, that was the end of the Soviet Empire, and we got lucky. I'd like to tell you that I knew the wall was coming down. Unfortunately, I cannot. I didn't know, but it did come down on my watch, and I will never forget it. East Germany remains a country in turmoil tonight. And you know, I'd arrived in Berlin two days before the wall came down because there was so much going on, on the, in the eastern sector. I was able to get into the east for the first time and do some reporting from there. You all represent the best of East Germany. And then late that afternoon, there was that famous news conference in which Gunter Schapowski, who was the propaganda chief, screwed up. He was handed a slip of paper at the very end and said that the Politburo has decided that uh, all citizens of the GDR can leave the GDR and come back through at any of the transit points. And I looked at my German national cameraman and sound man and I said, did he say what we thought he said? They were astonished. They said, he did. That means you can go out of the wall and come back anywhere you want to. The room was a buzz. This man gets up and leaves the room. I had an interview arranged with him uh, right after that news conference, and I went up and I read it back to him. Mr. Shabosky, do I understand it correctly? Citizens of the GDR can leave through any checkpoint that they choose for personal reasons. It is possible for them to go through the border. Freedom to travel. Yes, of course. And I went downstairs and some of my print colleagues were there and I said, it's over. I mean, the wall is open. So we got out and called the office in New York and uh, this is midday back in the States. We started making preparation for going on the air that night and I'm frantically trying to get this broadcast put together. I rushed out there. There were lots of students from the West who come to the top of the wall and the East Sherman guards were trying to hose them off. And then... My heart sank, thinking, oh my God, there's not going to be anybody there. I made this big deal about the wall coming down, and they've all been cleared off. And then the people got back up on the wall, and by the time we came on the air at 6.30, it was chaos. Stand by. A historic moment tonight. The Berlin Wall can no longer contain the East German people. NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Tonight, from West Berlin. We had a path on the satellite to get on the air, so that night I came on the air, and we owned the story. No CBS, no ABC. It was a worldwide exclusive. What you're watching live on television is a historic moment, a moment that will live forever. You're seeing the destruction of the Berlin Wall. We just threw out the script. I mean, I, we, I'd written this whole broadcast. And I said to our producer, stay with me, I'm going to have to outlive everything here. I'm just going to have to call on all my experience about what's been going on in the eastern part of not just Germany, but in the Soviet Union and how this is the defining moment. Now, for the first time since the wall was erected in 1961, people will be able to move through freely. I couldn't hear myself think. I just kept thinking right before we went on the air. I used the old astronauts prayer, cleaned it up some. Don't screw this up. Uh, this is a this is a big deal. It's amazing. And as we were standing there, somebody said, oh my God, look, they're taking down the wall. And there was a guy with a mallet and a chisel beginning to hammer away at the wall. The wall effectively has come down. And I mean physically as well. That's a chunk of the Berlin Wall. The party at the Brandenburg Gate went on all night long as they chipped away at the wall, as they danced atop of it, as they drank a lot. It's wonderful, it's wonderful. And I thought, 
is the this is the human story. This is the story of humankind. I mean, political tyrants can only go so far, but at the end, it's how people respond to their captivity and how they get out of it and how they relate to one another. And I think that is the enduring lesson of everything that I've ever seen in journalism. It's a night to remember. Indeed, it is a night to remember, and those of us, <laughs> you know, those of us at ABC remember it from the standpoint that Tom is right. He was there, he did it, and when you are confronted with a real deal, just accept it. <laughs> just accept it, and we do, and we praise him for it. Joining us now, live from Berlin, is one of America's premier journalists still today, looking and finding good stories, Tom Brokaw. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Sam. Well, Thanks you know, very much, Sam. It was and very, thank you, everybody. It was very exuberant, and we, we think watching you today brings us lots of memories. But what do you remember today, 30 years later, about that night at the wall? Well, I remember vividly, and I also want to say at the outset, it was not just me, it was the whole NBC team. Jerry Lamprecht, our foreign editor, had suggested two days earlier that I should go to Berlin. He said, I don't know what's going to happen. There's a lot of activity there. So I got here, and we were around for 24 hours before that memorable news conference with Gunther Schabowski. We had a satellite ordered, and a cameraman at another bridge got the first film of the people coming across the bridge and across into East Germany, from East Germany into West Germany. So it was a confluence of all those forces. And I remember as vividly as if it were yesterday, Sam, standing there thinking, my God, this is one of the biggest stories of my lifetime of the 20th century. We've got to get it right. And with the help of all my colleagues, in fact, I think at the end of the night, we did get it right. It was absolutely thrilling. And I remember one of our techies going over and getting a piece of wall and chipping it off and giving it to me. And that's in my personal collection. Tom, someone you know very well, James A. Baker III, Secretary Baker, is with us today here in Washington, and he would like to say a few words with you. So, Secretary Baker, if you'd come back up here, take whatever time you require, sir, and when you're finished with Tom, I'm going to come back to him. <coughs> Tom, how are you doing? Delay. I'm doing well, James. Good, good. You're looking. I have a question for you before you begin a question to me, if I can. <laughs> my question hey, is, it's, hey, it's we my later learn. <laughs> I, <laughs> you go ahead. We later learned that Shubowski, oh, I was going to say that we later learned that Shubowski got it wrong. The Politburo had not said they can leave. They were looking at a possibility that they would have a program where they could leave and have to come back. Mary Saroy, who is a, journal, a, a, a prominent historian at Harvard, did the whole story. And Shabowski left that news conference, went out to the compound where all of the Politburo members lived, and they were all asleep. They didn't know what was going on. <laughs> so my question for you is, did we have any indication from our espionage people and our intelligence people that there was a possibility that this was going to happen? The uh, short answer, Tom, is no. Uh, it came it came as every bit as much of a surprise to us, I think, as it did to you. I remember it very, very well. I was hosting a lunch for Corazon Aquino, president of the Philippines and the State Department, and uh, an aide passed me a note saying that the Berlin that people were allowed free transit now between uh, the GDR and the Federal Republic of Germany, and it looked like the wall might be coming down. And I raised a toast to that prospect, excused myself, and went over to the White House to meet with President Bush and Brent uh, Scowcroft to, to talk about what our response ought to be. And you know, uh, I think history will, will clearly mark the uh, correctness of George Bush's moderated response to what was a cataclysmic event because he knew that we still had a lot of business business to do with Gorbachev and Shevardnadze, and we weren't going to stick it in their eye. But the answer to your question is, as far as I know, we didn't have any adverse, any uh, advanced knowledge at all, intelligence or otherwise. 
But one of the things that we learned is, in my trips back here, after all, uh, since then, I spent today at the Stasi headquarters. That was an infamous, uh, that was the infamous group on the east part of uh, Germany that was arresting citizens left and right. I saw four miles of files on East German citizens. Right. And finally, that oppression, that complete pressure on East German citizens that they couldn't live their lives as they wanted to, broke through. And it really, I thought the wall came down mostly because of our strong stand in the West, but also citizens from the ground up in the East pushing back against their oppressors. Tom, that's absolutely right, and I've just given a few remarks here at this event in which I said that I don't think that any single uh, American president was responsible for the fall of the wall. Every one of our American presidents and every administration from Harry Truman through George H.W. Bush uh, were steadfast in opposing the spread of communism and the, and the uh, imprisonment, if you will, of the people of the captive nations of Eastern in Europe. And I said, and I believe strongly, uh, as I suspect you do, that it was the indomitable spirit of those citizens of the captive nations that made possible our victory in the Cold War. Uh, James, 30 years later, what are the lessons now for modern America and for the West, for that matter? Well, I think one of the lessons is that diplomacy works when it's properly uh, exercised. And we're here at Georgetown, which has, a, as you know, an extraordinarily fine uh, school of, of, of diplomacy and international relations. And I think, uh, and last night I went to an event, uh, Tom, in the State Department where, uh, where they've established a museum, an American museum, National Museum of American Diplomacy. We only have 400 museums that are military in their na in, con in their in their nature, and there's never been an, a, a museum in, in the United States that's or an institution, to, for that matter, that celebrates the historic events of American diplomacy through the years. And the State Department has now uh, is now establishing one, and I think that's a very very good uh, a good thing to do. But but most of all, if you look Look at the at the uh, diplomacy that uh, George H. W. Bush pursued in the aftermath of that stunning victory of the fall of the wall. He knew we had huge a huge task to perform was to try and re reunite Germany peacefully uh, as a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and he knew that we had to continue continue to try and achieve a peaceful end of the Cold War. I think Mikhail Gorbachev, and I, I, I'm sure you may share this view, Tom, but I think Mikhail Gorbachev will be, will be remembered very well by history because he, after all, after all, was the first Soviet leader who did not elect to use force to keep the empire together. I couldn't agree with you more. As you know, I did the first interview with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. And uh, one of the things I remember, uh, I was meeting him for the first time, and they were putting the Russian equipment on him, which were not nearly as sophisticated as ours. So I reached over his lapel to change it. And I looked at him and I said, Mr. Gorbachev, you have to understand this is what I have to do in my job every day. And he looked at me with a stern appearance and he said, Mr. Brokaw, you would not believe what I have to do in my job every day. <laughs> so it was the beginning of a very strong personal relationship. <laughs> I want to say something as well, if I can, about modern Germany, because we've been here for a few days. And you know, there's a lot of turmoil in Central Europe and the place of Germany and, uh, and Angela Merkel and where, and where we go from here. The fact of the matter is that this country, in the last 120 years, started two world wars, had the Holocaust on their conscience, and then became partners with the West. The big issue is, 
Where does Germany go from here? And where does Central Europe go from here? I'd be interested, Mr. Secretary, in some of your thoughts on that. Well, I think it's extremely important that we continue to uh, pursue a policy of anchoring Germany firmly into the West. You know, another a significant achievement that uh, we talked about a lot last night in terms of, dip, of a dip diplomatic achievement was to get Germany unified in peace and freedom as a member of the NATO alliance over the opposition of our allies, the British, and the French and the Soviet Union, who weren't our allies, of course, but they were steadfast opponents to German unification. But we got that done. Uh, and, that, and that was done through the, the steadfast and, um, uh, and strong practice of deft and continuing diplomacy. We need to remember that. We also need to remember in this country, Tom, in my view, how important our alliances are to the strength of America. Our alliances enable us to leverage our leadership, our world leadership, significantly. And, we, and those alliances are fraying. And I had uh, dinner last night uh, next to the ambassador uh, uh, of Germany to the United States. And we both uh, bemoan the fact that the relationship between Germany and the United States is not, is not as strong as it was uh, during those days and at the End of the end of the Cold War and the uh, and the way we all cooperated uh, to deal with those challenges at that time. We need to we need to do that again today. I, I know we don't want to take up all of Sam's time, but my only closing thought is, um, Mr. Secretary and Sam, is that in my few days here already, and I've, this is my third trip back to Germany since the wall came down, I have been reminded about how conscious everybody in this country is about what they went through, whether they were living in the East or in the West. They do have real difficulties going on right now. The people who were left in the East are not very happy about how they're being treated, but they're trying to work on it. And I would hope that in America, younger generations, including my children and my grandchildren, will be more conscious of how we all have a stake in preserving peace, not just in our country, but around the world. Absolutely. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Tom, and I think that's the challenge facing our policymakers today. And uh, I've just given a few remarks here in which I said, I thought those, this may be very self-serving and I apologize for that, but I think those policymakers would do well to look at the foreign policies of Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush and how they were pursued, how they were formulated, and how they were implemented, because we're facing some of the similar challenges today. I really think that uh, that it's, it's an imperative that we recognize the importance of the North Atlantic Alliance, the importance of American leadership leadership uh, in the world, because that gives cohesion, that gives the Europeans a reason and a way to come together, because a lot of those wars you're talking about started right there in Europe, and I, and I fear that others could, concede, could happen as well if we don't uh, re-strengthen uh, the, the North Atlantic Alliance. But it sure is good to see you, Tom, and there are a lot of quail in Texas waiting for you to get back. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. <laughs> He'll still be alive when I leave, unfortunately. <laughs> Sam, thank you. Thanks just very much for having me on. Well, Tom, just a moment. I, I want to thank Secretary Baker. By the way, uh, should you decide to run for the presidency, I think you might have some support. <laughs> you, you think so? Yes. yes. That's it. That's it. People already do that at night. <laughs> Tom Brokaw, now my friend Tom, I have prepared a number of very tough questions. Oh, and I know how to do it on you. But Tom, you'll understand when I tell you we didn't buy more satellite time. It's about to expire. So I've got to thank you for joining us today. <laughs> Sam, it's been my pleasure and my honor. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Tom. He's really a great guy. If you think there was competition in my day and today among reporters and networks and, and news gathering organizations, of course there was. But it was all kind of a fraternity in which you knew who the good guys were, and there was one of the top, and who weren't so good. And Tom was the best. Now, now I'm going to move over to the chair here.
to sit. J James A. Baker just said he was 90. Well, I'm 86. <laughs> never, never, if you find a chair, refuse to sit down. <laughs> Joining us now are two scholars who are recognized experts on our subject today. Jeffrey Engel is the founding director of the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University, an expert on the presidency and the history of modern American diplomacy. He has written 12 books on these subjects, including one titled The Fall of the Berlin Wall, The Revolutionary Legacy of 1989. And his latest book is titled Impeachment and American History. Thank you for being with us today, Jeffrey. Uh, Peter Robinson is the Murdoch Distinguished Policy Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the host, you still do the television show? Yes. The host of Hoover's television interview program, Uncommon Knowledge. He was a principal speechwriter for both George Herbert Walker Bush and Ronald Reagan, and the author of a book, How Ronald Reagan Changed My Life. But perhaps, Peter, you will always be best known as the person who wrote the speech for President Reagan that contained perhaps the most famous line ever delivered, standing in front of the Berlin Wall. And we'll get to that. Welcome to you, too. Thank you, Sam. All right, throughout the Cold War, Berlin was always a focal point of conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. In 1948, you may recall, people of a certain age, the Soviets under Joseph Stalin blocked the road access to Berlin, so it had to come through their zone. And that very dangerous situation was relieved only with an airlift in which supplies to the besieged city were brought in by air. The second Berlin crisis began when in 1958, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev demanded that the Allied occupation of Berlin be ended and Berlin became a free city. Jeffrey, please pick up the story from there. Well, this is where we have to remember that Germany is really at the heart of the entire Cold War. I mean, there is an ideological function, of course, between communism and capitalism that we always focus on. But the true struggle is who's going to control the resources of Central Europe. And for Nikita Khrushchev, he had a major problem in the late 1950s and 1960s as he tried to consolidate power in Germany. Uh, Germans kept leaving. As I say, they, in East Germany in particular, they would go into the American zone and not come back. The people were voting with their feet. Ultimately, the decision was made in Moscow to erect a wall, essentially a wall not to keep people out, but to keep people in, to keep the people from leaving, because to be honest, the best and the brightest were the ones who most wanted to find a new life in the West. Well, am I also correct that the, our intelligence services and the intelligence services of other Western nations went into East Germany freely through there being no checkpoint there, and we're able to establish their agents and all that, and the GDR was very upset about that. Well, the geography is really key. I mean, this is something I actually have to explain to, to my students, that because Germany was divided up into four zones at the end of World War II, four zones of occupation, Soviet, American, British, and French, uh, and so too was Berlin, even after a consolidation of the British, American, and French zones, we still had that section in Berlin that was internationally controlled in the heart of the German capital, in the heart of German, uh, East Germany. Uh, it's hard, we're really hard pressed to find another example of a country that is willing to have another country in charge of its major capital city for decades on end. And Nikita Khrushchev, as you pointed out, tried time and again to get the Americans and their allies to leave. Okay, we'll come back to this period of erection of the wall, but I've got to jump ahead. I've got to jump ahead to the most dramatic period, which is what we're celebrating today. Peter, Ted Sorensen wrote for John F. Kennedy a famous couple of lines, ask not what your country can do for you. And you wrote these powerful lines for Ronald Reagan, your president, which he delivered in 1987. I was there standing in front of the Brandenburg Gate and the Berlin Wall. Uh, arguably his most remembered lines that he ever delivered. Let's hear some of them right now. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, 
Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Wow. How did you come to write those lines? I went to Berlin to do some research about three, this would be six weeks before the president delivered the speech. Senior staff had simply said he's going to stand here, he'll have an audience of 10 to 40,000 people, he'll talk for 30 minutes to say something about foreign policy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, most of that day went badly for me, the young speechwriter. I went to the site where the president would stand. People, Tom Brokaw remarked on this, it's almost impossible to convey now that the wall is gone what it felt like at that place. You look in East Berlin and it was though the color had been drained from, the, from a photograph, gray, dilapidated buildings, soldiers marching back and forth. You turn and look into West Berlin, color, activity, life, and that dividing line of the wall. So I just thought, what do I write? What do I give the president that's equal to him and to this place? In the evening, I broke away from the American party and went to a su suburb of West Berlin where Berliners put on a dinner party for me. I had, didn't know anyone there but the host and hostess and I had a mutual friend in Washington. And I explained that I'd been told by the ranking American diplomat that the president shouldn't mention the wall, they'd all gotten used to it. Was that so? And there was a silence. I thought, I've committed just the faux pas that the diplomat was afraid the president would commit. And then one man raised his arm and pointed and said, my sister lives just a few kilometers in that direction. How do you think we feel about that wall? And they went around the room, each person talking about the wall. They had stopped talking about it, but they hadn't stopped hating it. And our hostess, a lovely woman called Ingeborg Eltz, charming throughout the dinner party, but now she became angry. And she said, if this man Gorbachev is serious with this talk, glasnost, perestroika, he can prove it by coming here and getting rid of that wall. And that went into my notebook because I knew the moment I heard that, that if President Reagan had been there in my place, he would have responded to that remark. The power, the decency, the simplicity, the truthfulness of it. And it's true that I put the words on paper, but that speech belonged to Ronald Reagan. I was, every bit of it was my trying to give him material that fit his beliefs, his mode of expression, for that specific spot in that moment. Yes, so it was suggested what, what, by a German woman. What, what you wrote did not please his entire foreign policy establishment. Tell us about that. That is I mean, true. That you and he against the world. Well, I take those odds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the speechwriters, we pulled a little bit of a fast one. Ordinarily, speeches went out to staffing before they went to the president, but in this case, long story here, I won't go into that, but in this case, we got it to the president on a Friday as he was headed to Camp David. We met him the following Monday, and we discussed the speech, and he said he particularly wanted to deliver that line about tearing down the wall. That wall has to come down. I just remember that vividly in the Oval Office. Then the speech went out to staffing, and for the three weeks before, between that meeting in the Oval Office and the day he delivered the speech, the State Department, the National Security Council tried to suppress it. They submitted, my journal shows seven different drafts on seven different pretexts, but all eliminating the call to tear down the wall. They thought it would raise false expectations. Howard Baker, then chief of staff, told me years later he thought it just sounded unpresidential. Uh, State Department concerned that it would put Gorbachev on the spot by calling him out personally. This went on and on and on, and finally, Ken Duberstein, then deputy chief of staff, a friend of yours I know, Sam, sat the president down. They were now in Italy, which is where the president was speaking before going to Berlin. There was a Venice Economic Summit, and he took the speech back to the president for another decision. Talked about the objections, had the president read the central passage, and then Ken told me that they talked about it, and then Ronald Reagan got that Ronald Reagan twinkle in his eye and said, now, I'm the president, aren't I, Ken? <laughs> yes, sir, we are clear about that much. So I get to decide if that line stays in? Yes, sir, it is your decision. Well, then, it stays in. Well, that was Ronald Reagan. Now, Jeffrey, who was right on this one? President Reagan or his entire foreign policy team? 
You know, let me point out before I answer that, that we're at a university and I have tenure. So I can tell you the real truth. Uh, they were both right, but I think honestly, President Reagan was less right than the foreign policy team because we now know that the difficulties that Gorbachev were facing were primarily from conservative hardline communists who wanted to repeal back, if you will, perestroika and glasnost. The real danger in, in the end of the Cold War period that we're talking about, which by the way, no one at the time would have referred to it at the end of the, as the end of the Cold War, the real danger is not that the Soviets will be too friendly. It's not that, that Mikhail Gorbachev will tear, tear down the wall. It's that he'll do something like tear down the wall and then find himself facing a coup the next week. So anything I think that was done to encourage opposition to Gorbachev, to put him on the spot, as you said, was extraordinarily dangerous. And here I think you can see a real interesting difference between the, the Reagan administration and the Bush administration. You know, as Secretary Baker said at the time when he came in in 1989, this is not a friendly takeover. Uh, there really was a, a different mindset because the Reagan administration, as a historian I would say, was fundamentally focused on the right moral path of trying to end the Soviet Union and end the Cold War and didn't give a whole lot of thought to what happened the next day. Whereas the Bush administration was confronted immediately with the problem of do we deal with Gorbachev and then what happens next? And they essentially had to, to pick up the pieces, if you will, of the great moral clarity that Reagan offered. Well, you know, you're quite right. When Ronald Reagan was not president, what he said about the communist state and the Soviet Union was interesting and people agreed or disagreed with him. But when he became president, now it was important to get his view as President of the United States. And in his first press conference, I asked him whether he thought that the Soviet Union was interested in detente uh, or by some other means of world domination. And out it came. They lie, they steal, they cheat, they commit any crime. And uh, wow, the boys in Moscow must have loved that. Well, in fact, they, they were terrified of it. I mean, well, this is one of those things that we now know because we have all their documentation. One of the great things about having a state collapse is you get to keep all the records. Uh, and, <laughs> We now know that there were a series in 1983 in particular of events where Soviet policymakers heard Ronald Reagan, heard him talk about a crusade of fire, heard him talk about purging the world of communism, heard him talk about the communist state as being an evil empire, and were genuinely worried that he meant what he said. If you really took the president at his word, I mean, I know it's hard to imagine these days, but presidential words matter. <laughs> if you really take the president at his word, if you're in Moscow, you're very scared. Jeff, Jeff, if I, the academic approach of course has its place above all in a great university such as this, but if I may say so, you're worrying about something that worked in practice uh. and wondering whether it could work in theory. It worked out. You know, that's, that is true. No. You, you, Jeff, no, I have, excuse me. Sir. You, you are is, going to get a, a response. This is a you can't argue with that at the end. No, I can't because this is a fundamental problem of how we teach and understand history. Just because something works out well doesn't mean it was destined to work out well. No, but it does mean that it did work out well. <laughs> Okay, but By I, would the way, say, I would say one more thing. I would say one more thing. You Dick, make, Allen, hold, Dick Allen told me that the day after that press conference, the president said to Dick Allen, who was then the national security advisor, Dick, the Soviets do lie, cheat, and steal, don't they? And Dick <laughs> Allen said, well, yes, Mr. President, of course they do. And the president said, oh, well, all right then. <laughs> okay, now, okay, let me, let me, I think you have two views here, okay. and you can think about it, but Peter, I want to ask you a question about what Reagan might have done in 1961. Tough guy, meant what he said, and called us, you know, what, like he saw it. When that wall was being erected, many people, some people at least, thought that John Kennedy should now move aggressively to stop it. He had the legal authority from the standpoint of the Four Power Agreement. Beyond that, if the Soviets could get away with that, what couldn't they get away with? Because he'd been to Vienna and came after that meeting with Nikita Khrushchev telling Scotty Rest in the New York Times, he savaged me, he took me. Would Reagan in 1961 have said, no, no wall, and I've got the force to stop it? I believe that Ronald Reagan would have done just what John Kennedy did, which is to say, you pursue the policy of containment. You draw lines. As John Kennedy said in one meeting or another during the Berlin Wall crisis, well, all right, we have the legal authority to take that wall down, but suppose they put it up again six inches inside their own borders. Uh, 
Containment was pushing back against the Soviets, but not creating a general war. Ronald Reagan, and we now look back over eight years, there was one uh, military engagement in the island of Grenada. He was very cautious. In f he was rhetorically aggressive, morally aggressive, but very cautious on the ground. And I, I, b I believe different parties, it says something about, well, Ronald Reagan himself said he didn't leave the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party left him. Reagan, we know, supported Harry Truman in 1948. He or headed an organization in Hollywood supporting Truman, and he had great admiration for FDR, but also admiration for John Kennedy. I think they were they had they pursued fundamentally similar policies. Jeff, Jeffrey, we're running out of time. However, I want you to talk about what I mentioned. When Kennedy met Khrushchev, Khrushchev clearly got the better of him by his own admission. What was the result of that? The result of that was Nikita Khrushchev felt that he had the ability to put nuclear weapons into Cuba. I mean, we don't get the Cuban Missile Crisis without John Kennedy essentially doing poorly by his own admission in, in Vienna. Uh, by the same token, though, uh, if we say that we want that you would praise Reagan for pursuing Kennedy's policy of containment, I would argue that that's exactly what you did not do in 1987, because Reagan calling out the Soviet Union to collapse, which again, great line, and by the way, something that was very aspirationally wonderful, suggests that the United States had the power to make it happen. The changes going on in the Soviet Union were actually what brought down the Soviet was, Empire. He was calling on Mr. Gorbachev to tear down the wall. There was nothing, well, see, there was no implied was, threat. There was nothing involving American power at all. And by the way, at the, by that point, he felt he, he had dealt with Gorbachev. Anyway, we, my, we can, my, my producer, we can, shall we arm wrestle friend, this one uh, to an end, Sam? Doran Smith might shoot me for this, not literally, but I'm gonna extend this just a little bit, uh, because what happened now? What happens as a result of the fact that the Berlin Wall did come down for a period of time? It looked like democracy was on the rise. Gorbachev still had Soviet tanks. And until that moment, every time there was these uprisings in Eastern Europe, in their domain, those tanks rumbled. Why didn't they rumble this time? They rumbled because Gorbachev was able to stay in power. If Gorbachev had been removed by the hardliners, of course, the coup that finally occurred in August of 1991 was a coup that was predicted by the American intelligence services for President Bush the first week he was in office. And he basically got the exact same memo every week that if you push too hard, if you try to get the only person in the world who can keep reform going, if you put him in a hot spot, and give aid to his enemies, then that is going to undo everything that you might hope to do. Now I have to say, we have to remember, the Bush administration and the Reagan administration were not entirely clear that Gorbachev himself was a true reformer. But they knew that there were a lot of people who were much worse waiting to get in line after him. Sam, uh, I, give I me asked, the last word. Oh, weigh in on this. All right, everyone. I'd like to, because on, on that, that you asked, typical of Sam Donaldson, you asked the question of questions, which is why didn't the Soviets roll in with their with the tanks. And it, as it happens, in a conversation with Mike Reagan, I asked Gorbachev that question. And he said, you must understand that Ronald Reagan and I shared the same Christian ethics. I said, what? And through the translator, he said, no, no, I'm a good communist. But fundamentally, we, were, we shared Christian ethics. I simply was not going to open fire on innocent human beings. So there you have, that's the ultimate failure of the Soviet project. They had not created a new Soviet man. What you had in Mikhail Gorbachev was an old Russian formed by the Judeo-Christian outlook on life. That's why the tanks didn't roll. Peter Robinson, Jeffrey Engel, thank you so much. I wish we had more time for being with us today. <laughs>
came out to discuss this situation. Let's watch. We've just gone into uh, a brief statement like here. I've just been briefed by the Secretary of State and the Security Advisor on the uh, latest uh, news coming out of Germany. And, of course, I welcome the decision by the East German leadership to open the borders to those wishing to have greater travel. And uh, this, if it's implemented fully, certainly conforms with the Helsinki Accords, Helsinki Final Act, which the CDR uh, signed. And if the uh, GDR goes forward now, uh, and um, this wall built in 61 will have very little relevance. And it clearly is a good development in terms of human rights. And I must say that after discussing this here with the Secretary of State and National Security Advisor, I'm very pleased with the uh, with this development. Relationship with the Federal Republic that if we we're Chancellor Cole asks us to give uh, some assistance, I'm certain we would give it serious consideration. I mean, I don't know what he, what it is they'd have in mind, but, uh, because I think with a with truly open border, it is hard to predict how many will be trying to leave, and so it's uh, it's a dynamic development. And we just have to wait and see. But uh, our relationship with the Federal Republic is such that we would want to be at the uh, maximum help if it was needed. So far, Germany has done a magnificent job in uh, handling these uh, those who have preceded this new, new, new exodus. Is this the end of the Well, I don't think any single event uh, is the end of uh, what you might call the Iron Curtain. But clearly, this is a long way from the from the harsh days of the, of the harshest Iron Curtain days, a long way from that. Mr. President, we think the indications are the worst of what happened. Can we say that this may be an indication that they're headed toward the loosening or even the expanding of the Warsaw Pact? Well, I, I think you have to say what, what you mean by Warsaw Pact. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that it's certainly a loosening up in terms of travel. It concur, concur, concurs with the uh, Helsinki Final Act, and it is a very good development. Uh, our objective is uh, Europe, whole and free. And uh, is it a step towards that? I would say yes. Gorbachev talks about a common home. Uh, is it a step towards that? Probably so. What it, in the, what you just said, that this is a sort of great victory for our side in the big east-west battle, but you don't seem elated, and I'm wondering if you're thinking I'm of elated, the problem. I'm just not an emotional kind of guy. Well, how I mean, elated are you? I'm very pleased. What I've been very pleased with a lot of other developments, and as I've told you, I think... The United States part of this, which is not related to this development today particularly, is being handled in a proper fa fashion. And we'll have some that'll, that'll uh, suggest more flamboyant courses of action for this country. And uh, we're, we're, I think, handling this properly with allies, staying in close touch and uh, this dynamic change, try to help as development takes place, trying to enhance reform, both political and economic. And so I, the fact that I'm not bubbling over, maybe it's, maybe it's uh, getting along towards evening, because I feel very good about it. Well, you Thank you. 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 Thank you.
rapid change inside Eastern Europe. And we've been talking about that today, once just before we, you all came in here. Uh, we've been talking about the Gorbachev uh, meeting. And one of the things that we are determined we will discuss, and I know he'll want to discuss, is this change. Well, and joining us today, a distinguished panel to talk about that day in Washington, beginning with that uh, gentleman, if you spotted him at the end of the video, he's standing against the wall behind Secretary Baker as President Bush talks, Marlon Fitzwater, right here, who served both Ronald Reagan <laughs> and George Herbert Walker Bush, the long, one of the longest running press secretaries in the history of our country, and someone I must say, and uh, I say it uh, admiringly, who knew how to handle the press. Welcome, Marlon. And he's written you, four sir. books about his experiences in the White House. And I've got to tell you the title of one of them. Call the Briefing, Bush and Reagan, Sam and Helen, a decade with presidents and the press. Welcome, Marlon. And with us also is two reporters. He was, I wasn't there, I, was on, I had left that beat. But two reporters who were on that beat and been many years, Gene Gibbons, right here, who uh, went down to the White House press room with six presidents when they were in office and was full time there for three of them, Ronald Reagan, George Herbert Walker Bush, and Bill Clinton. Reporting, was it the Reuters group? That's correct. Uh, I got it from Wikipedia, Gene, I couldn't remember. Now, Peter Mayer, you can correct me if I've got your biography wrong. Peter, who on that day was with Mutual Radio, but then went on to a 20-year career with CBS News. Peter has covered every president from Jimmy Carter to Barack Obama. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Now, Marlon, it was like a bombshell? You didn't know? President Bush didn't know? How did he get the news? What happened? Well, the, uh, can I go use the podium up You here? may. You may indeed. I, I talked about standing But I get it back. Up. Okay, you can, <laughs> you can always take it back, Sam. Uh, well, it's not Dancing with the Stars. Uh, <laughs> oh, but I do uh, thank Sam and thank uh, the group for having me, uh, me here and to go through this. They asked me to go through the president's uh, afternoon when he was first informed uh, about the, the uh, fall of the wall. And so I wanted to just present a, this brief narrative. Um, First of all, it's, I want to thank the, the panel before us who uh, filled us in on the events before the wall came down, and, and so it gave us a good background to consider what happened uh, during the afternoon. And uh, I would just say that uh, inside the White House there were no sirens, no announcements of change, except for the relentless ticking of the wire service machines that they maintained in the National Security Council room. And uh, the, the, uh, the NSC staff always uh, got the first notice of everything. And uh, they reported uh, that uh, Reuters was ha had a story coming out uh, from Berlin about the wall. And they delivered a copy of it to my deputy, Roman Papaduke. And he came rushing into my office and said, we have this story, you better take a look at it. And, uh, and I, I did immediately, of course, and uh, the, the National Security Council staff had stamped confidential on the top of it. <laughs> and I said, now how can this be? This is the news wire from Reuters that's gone to every radio station newspaper in the world. <laughs> Only in America would we stamp that confidential. <laughs> But in any case, uh, I said immediately, I'm going go to go to the Oval Office. So I took it in to, uh, to uh, talk to the president. The secretary ushered me in. She said he's in the study, which is a little office off the Oval. And so I went through and went back to the study, walked in. He was working at the uh, desk there. And I just handed him the wire service story without comment. Uh, and he read it. He read it and started reading it. And uh, I, the, uh, the reaction was fairly, uh, very pensive. He, he wanted to kind of take it all in. And uh, this, this was a busy day for him in the White House because we were going to, we were having a state visit from Corazon Aquino, the president of the Philippines. And so he had already done the speech on the South Grounds and 
meeting with uh, her and, and her team and uh, he was preparing for another afternoon of meetings and a state dinner that night. And so this uh, took everybody by surprise and clearly uh, was going to reschedule many things during the day. The, uh, the first thing he did was he looked up after he read the article and said, uh, I need uh, General Scowcroft and Bob Gates, who is the Deputy National Security Advisor, and Secretary Baker. And they, uh, all three were called and came uh, over to the Oval Office uh, immediately. So the four of us were there uh, talking about it and the President turned on his television and uh, he could see that uh, CNN was reporting the, the story and uh, this was still embryonic and there was some, some chipping at the wall. The fellow with the uh, hammer and chisel was up there working, uh, but beyond that it was not clear that they were going to be able to take down the entire uh, edifice. And, uh, and, and the, uh, but the story was there. It was on CNN at the time was the cable news uh, ne network. And uh, about that time, I, uh, the president was starting to ask some questions from Secretary Baker and, uh, and the others there about what they knew about it and what happened and so forth. And I must say that I, at that point, I recalled a book by Richard Ben Kramer. Some of you remember him. He was a reporter who covered the 88 campaign of President Bush. And uh, his, he wrote a great book called What It Takes. And it was really kind of a profile of the candidates. But in it, he describes President Bush as being a thoughtful guy and that when he, when he met an uncomfortable situation that he wasn't certain about, he had a tendency to slump down in his chair. Well, I had seen that phenomenon a number of times uh, with President Bush, and I looked over and I noticed that he was on his way down. <laughs> he was leaning back and going down. He was trying, and, uh, and I suggested that we put out a statement that the press was all over us upstairs and uh, they were very excited about this and that I thought he needed uh, some kind of statement that gave context to this for the American people. And he said, well, I'm not going to give a press conference. <laughs> and he says, furthermore, there's not going to be any dancing on the wall, Marlon. Uh, and I took that as a pretty personal direction. <laughs> and, uh, but he did, he did think about it some more and he said, uh, okay, I agree that uh, we'll do something. I want to do it informally. And I suggest, well, why don't we just bring the pool, which is always available to come into the Oval Office, bring them into the Oval. You can sit at your desk, uh, which is the greatest symbol of authority that America has, and uh, talk to them then about it and uh, decide what you want to say. So he, he took a little time to kind of give himself a, a, a self-rehearsal. He said, I'm concerned about uh, the reaction of the Soviet Union. We don't know what it's going to be. We don't know uh, whether they're going to uh, uh, react against this militarily or uh, exactly what they will have to say. And uh, secondly, we have the future to think about. German reunification and the status of the captive nations and uh, what happens to the, uh, to the uh, Soviet bloc countries. And see, so there's a lot of future that we have yet to work out with, with uh, President Gorbachev. And all of that took place in about 30 minutes. And uh, we brought in the pool. My president said, when do you want to do this? And I said, well, any time before 6 o'clock. At that time, you could get on the evening news at, at that hour. And he says, well, let's do it now which is kind of typical of President Bush. When, when he first uh, hired me, he said, I'm going to run a different kind of press operation. I want to go in the briefing room anytime I want to, day or night, and talk to the press if I think it's necessary. I said, right on. Good for me. Uh, and he said, I don't want to do any of these East Room shows. I said, that's good for me too. Uh, he said, well, I'll do one. So he did the first one, and then he never did it again. <laughs> So this was in the, in the mold of the way he, uh, he liked to pursue uh, issues with the press. When the president came in, uh, he, he made the statement where he said exactly uh, that this was a good development, but it was a very measured statement and everyone could, uh, could tell it was. And the first question was about uh, 
uh, kind of what the president expect, expected, and then there were a lot of questions about uh, the, the coming down of the Iron Curtain and the future of the Warsaw Pact, and the president took all of those. But question number seven came from Leslie Stahl, the CBS News correspondent who was in the pool. The press pool now generally represents uh, the various elements of the news media, magazines, newspapers, television, radio, and, and, and a few others, but usually about 15 people. One network, and that network's cameras cover it as well. So Leslie was the correspondent assi assigned uh, with CBS to the pool that day. And she said, you know, this is, a, this is sort of a great victory for our side in this East-West battle, but don't you, uh, you don't seem very elated. And her office, of course, had told her about the excitement that was going on around the country and, and also told her that uh, Congressman Gebhardt was saying the president should uh, be celebrating this and that Leader Mitchell had suggested the president should be going to Berlin and join in the celebration over there. Uh, so she was prepared to follow up with a question uh, that more or less came out of her discussion with... Uh, and Marlon, you were prepared yes. to tell us what President, why President Bush did that, but I want to turn right now, just for a moment, hold on, hold everything, to uh, Jean and Peter. Now, what do you think of Leslie's question, and what did you think of Bush's general reaction? Well, I was at my desk back in the press room listening to the audio feed of the Q&A, trying to compose a story, a breaking news story, about the President's reaction to this very historic development. And it was very difficult to do because there were no ringing declarations, no dramatic quotes. You know, we people in the news business like to get a headline regardless of the consequences. And I think, as Secretary Baker said, uh, the president just wouldn't uh, stick it in their eye. It would have been great television had he gone out to the Rose Garden and did cartwheels, you know, celebrating this, this great development. Or it would have been wonderful domestic politics for him terrible domestic politics for Mikhail Gorbachev, who might have been under pressure to rule the tanks. Peter. Well, I was on the pool that day, on the floor with the, with the microphone. Um, I also have to say that I, w I was fortunate, Sam, to have a number of visits with President Bush, thanks to uh, dear Gene Becker, who's here, uh, who helped Gene? clear the way for that. Where are you, Gene? And uh, we chatted in his office in Houston. We chatted at the apartment over the library. Uh, we chatted in, at Walker's Point in Kennebunkport. And at our final visit, just months before we sadly said goodbye to, to him. Uh, we had a poignant chat about this, partially about this, in his office at Walker's Point. And I always wanted to tell him, Sam, and, and everyone, how I felt sort of naively, journalistically disappointed as we left the Oval Office that day. Uh, and, I, and I told him, you know, I was disappointed that day, sir, and I, and I have to admit it to you. And he said, well, why? We're, you know, really, why? And I said, well, because, you know, we're always looking for that pithy quote, that sound bite that uh, is going to make the story uh, either in print uh, or on the air. And I, I sense that this is going to be my last chance to talk to him about that. But I also told him that even before I returned to my little office in, in the, the basement of the White House that I realized that uh, exactly what it was that, that he was uh, trying not to do, and that was to antagonize the Soviet Union and, and make things difficult for, uh, for Mikhail Gorbachev. You know, this, this really was the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. And I think that uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush doesn't get enough credit for this was a, the disintegration, the first time in history that a great empire has disintegrated without bloodshed. And I think his subdued reaction to what happened that day has a lot to do with how it turned out. He was the man, man for the moment. And, and, you know, I don't know how many times we all, either on the staff or those following him, said, uh, we heard him say, you know, my mother always told me, don't be a braggadocio. And that was the last thing that he wanted to be that day, was to be a braggadocio. And as Secretary Baker said uh, at, at his funeral, and I, I wrote it down that day uh, when we were at the National Cathedral, he said, President Bush understood that humility toward, not humiliation of, a fallen adversary was the best path. Marlon, I'm coming back to you for the... I'm... 
I'm coming back to you for the last word, but I've got to say, you were been around this town a long time, even before you got to the, by the White House. You, you, you knew how to handle things, and you know presentation was very part of it. Now, for instance, a president might have, like the cock that crows when the sun comes up and says, ah, me. We have actually uh, seen that, perhaps, but the point is, <laughs> were you kind of afraid that maybe the low key, for all the good reasons that you and our two reporters have said, might still not do him that much good with the re-election campaign someday? Well, I didn't, you know, what he actually said was, after the, Leslie asked the question, was, I am not an emotional kind of guy. Right. And that's, of course, what the news carried. And, uh, but as sometimes happens uh, in these situations, it's the accident, accidental question that's the best and the best of answers. And, and this uh, is kind of a personal uh, question and making it all the news just served to emphasize, again, the attitude that he wanted to take and that he didn't want to poke, it, uh, poke Gorbachev in the eye. And just one month later, uh, Gor Gor well, actually, three weeks later, we were in Malta with his first meeting with Gorbachev following all of this. And uh, the first thing Gorbachev did was thank him for not dancing on the wall. And so he was, he was right in anticipating how the Soviets would react to that. And uh, the, uh, the, the president was asked at that time if he could give the first leadoff uh, presentation at, in Malta because he wasn't sure how Gorbachev was reacting to the wall and all the events of the day and he wanted to be sure that before they started these meetings Gorbachev heard what the United States position was going to be and, he, what, he, and what he did was present a 17 point program of economic help that the United States was going to give the Soviet Union to help bring them into the world economy Marlon, I've got to stop you now, yep. only because the clock okay. tells me that the, the time is expiring. Uh, just, just let me, one, just one Please, sentence. I would not ever stand a, in your way, sir. As a, as a response, as a response. Have I ever in the briefing room stood in your way? This is the way we used to have to do every day. Can you believe that? <laughs> anyway, uh, I would just want to say that uh, Gorbachev's response at the end of this uh, Bush's presentation of his plan was to look at the floor, hushed audience, looked up at the table, looked the president in the eye and says, that is exactly what I wanted to hear. And from there on, there was a dramatic change in East-West relations uh, that we uh, can talk about later. Thank you, Marlon, and Peter, and Gene. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, I wish we had all day, I wish we had all day. You know, because I would like to have heard about that Malta meeting and the hurricane which was on in the Mediterranean. Sam, can I just say yes. very, very quickly, everyone, when I'm asked, when I have the pleasure to speak to journalism students, who was your favorite press secretary? Here he is, the gold standard for press secretaries. Well, wait, 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 wait. And I know, I, know that Gene, I know that Gene agrees, and it's very easy, I know from watching him at the podium to make him turn red, I'm gonna try very hard, but there are two types of press secretaries, and I think you guys will agree. There are press secretaries who are mouthpieces, who are handed scripts, or asked to repeat tweets, and there are press secretaries who we knew were trusted communications advisors who had access to the presidents we covered, and this man had both. He was a communications advisor and a trusted uh, advisor to President Bush, and we knew that uh, at the end of the day, you would be going upstairs or into the Oval Office and consulting with And him. I also want to add, because I, I think we all agree on this, that uh, Marlon dodged and weaved and you know, smiled and you know, all of that, never made it out of and you know, served as president well, but never lied. What press secretaries must not do is lie. When they lie, they betray us all. And this man never did. Now tell us about your book. We're going to sell a book here and then we're going to go on. What happens when you put press on the podium, you can't stop them. <laughs> what you. about your book, your latest book? The book, the book. Yeah. Your latest book. Well, I, I, I just finished a book and Sam uh, gave me the opportunity I, to, to promote it. It's called Calm Before the Storm which is really a series of vignettes about the White House, which Sam has been kind enough to uh, give me a blurb on the back about the book. Uh, but in it, it also focuses on the president and on Desert Storm, 
Uh, and in it, I also have this uh, uh, soliloquy about Gorbachev telling the president, asking him about capitalism and democracy and how it works. And when I heard that, it was on on the air for, I mean, on uh, the helicopter coming back from Camp David. And he says, "How do you buy a house here? How do your banks work? How, what does a realtor do?" Uh, that's when we all first knew that he was really interested in uh, a, a different kind of uh, system for the Soviet Union. You no, know, that cowboy. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank, Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Uh, I'm sorry. It's in the family, the press, and all of that. We all got along, although we savaged each other every day in the press room. Uh, now it's time to turn to the expertise of one of the world's leading international affairs schools and one of our co-sponsors of this morning's program. And of course, they provided a wonderful hall for the event. The Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service here at Georgetown University, which this year is celebrating its centennial and to the school's dean, Dr. Joel Hellman. Dr. Hellman, the program is yours, sir. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Let me welcome you here on this beautiful, glorious day, an important day, on behalf of the School of Foreign Service, Georgetown University, uh, and our BMW Center for German and European Studies. And let me thank also um, our sponsors for this event, the George and Barbara Bush Foundation, the Reagan Institute, and the Atlantic Council. So history is punctuated by critical moments where events open up possibilities for fundamental change in the world order. And at these critical moments, the importance of leadership, of diplomacy, of intelligence, of careful analysis become essential to shaping outcomes. These are the moments that are the essence of what we do here at the School of Foreign Service and what we have been doing now for 100 years, the oldest school of Foreign Service and International Affairs in the United States. So it's in that spirit that I am excited that we had a chance to look into the history of such a critical global moment. And now we have a chance to pivot on the current importance. Where did the fall of the Berlin Wall 30 years after, where have they, has that left us in critical issues of the shape of the world order going forward. And for that, I'm pleased to have a wonderful panel um, of experts to talk through some of those thorny issues. I'll start by introducing Eric Edelman. He is a distinguished practitioner in residence at SAIS, a career foreign service officer who held key positions at the US Embassy in Moscow and then handling Soviet affairs at the Pentagon during the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. He went on to ambassadorships in Turkey and Finland and eventually became US Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. Welcome. Next, we have Charles Kupchin. Um, he's a professor of international affairs here at SFS and the Department of Government, as well as a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He served as special assistant to the president and senior director for European affairs on the staff of the National Security Council in the Obama administration, and he held senior positions at NSC and the State Department policy planning staff. Welcome, Charlie. And finally, we have Paula Dobriansky, um, who first and foremost is a graduate of the School of Foreign Service, um, uh, and indeed a distinguished expert on Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. As a diplomat, she served five US presidents, Democrat and Republican. She was at the NSC covering Soviet and East European affairs during the fall of the Berlin Wall. Ultimately, she rose to an extended stint as Under Secretary of State for Democracy and Global Affairs, and of course, she is a professor here in our Masters of the Science of Foreign Service program and a member of our board of the SFS. So I'm going to go over to the panel. Um, we'll have some time for discussion among ourselves uh, and then we're going to go to you, the audience, for questions on this panel um, and some of the things you heard earlier. So let me begin. So I want to start first. We talked a lot about the history of the event, the implications of the event, and the lessons learned from the event. Uh, James Baker started to give us some sense of what he felt the lessons learned from the event. 
Obviously, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the triumph of diplomacy, the importance of leadership, and how the fall of the Berlin Wall was handled. How we responded to a critical moment in which change in the global order was actually possible. I want first, what lessons do you take now as you think about foreign policy now in the current moment from that experience? Maybe we can start with you, Paula. All right, thank you. And I'd like to thank the four institutions for hosting this. This is just an incredible uh, moment, an opportunity to reflect on truly what is and was a, a most. Uh, uh, significant uh, point in history. Um, Secretary Baker, I think, well articulated a number of key points, but let me mention a few that I think maybe also need to be tossed in the mix. First, I'd start that there should be a lesson of optimism, that we can actually uh, make a difference and have an impact, and in those places, and change the status quo in those places where we may not always think that we can. So there's a lesson of optimism that I think undergirds all of this. There's also, I think, the crucial fact that here there was a kind of supposition of a lack of change that could take place. In other words, that totalitarian regimes were not necessarily vulnerable. And I think what we witnessed, not only with the fall of the wall, but the whole sequencing of events that really uh, highlighted that uh, there is great vulnerability and that here the power of ideas can really make a difference. The moral narrative, the fact that fundamental human freedoms um, uh, cannot be buried or blocked by any kind of wall or barrier. I think the consistency of a diplomatic approach combined with all the elements that the Secretary, Secretary Baker had mentioned about American leadership, the importance of our allies, the importance of also uh, the international uh, support that also reigned through this period. But he mentioned something that I don't want to uh, be left aside, and that is he mentioned the domestic component. And I think he's quite right. When I think back and reflect on the period of the Cold War, the fact that there was also the domestic element of bipartisanship and that kind of support that undergirded foreign policy, which also provided us with a very, very strong and resolute backbone. And I guess finally, I would just say that in some, I mentioned it earlier, but ideas matter. And here, in the height of the Cold War, I mean, it was between the issues of freedom, fundamental human freedoms and democracy, and against communism, as the Secretary articulated. And in this sense, there was that ideological battle, and we were very consistent in laying down markers as to what we stood for. Mm -hmm. Charlie, your thoughts? Yeah, <clears throat> quick, quick three points picking up on some of the things that Paula just said. Uh, the first would be to say that even though I agree completely with what we've heard this morning about the importance of states, people, and uh, foreign policy and engagement, let's keep in mind that in many respects the end of the Cold War was about history running away from statesmen, not the opposite. That is to say, the, the Soviet Union fell apart because Gorbachev tried to reform it and lost control. And what we ended up with was exactly what Paula mentioned, was the kind of flowering of the human spirit, the overthrow of the structures of the Soviet Union, and then Gorbachev and Reagan and uh, George W. H. W. Bush and others stepped in and, and did a remarkable job of controlling the aftermath. It's, it's stunning that the Cold War came to an end without war. Most transitions of that sort are usually very bloody. But it, it was about people power. It was grassroots. Uh, when I was a student in the 1980s, I went to Poland after the imposition of martial law. Uh, and I, I didn't see the, the end of the Cold War coming any more than anyone else, but I saw a clear sign that, that the lie was now in the street. When I went to meet people like Adam Mithnick and others, they said, I'm, I want to meet you in the lobby of the main international hotels. And they would wave at the security people that were monitoring us. Uh, and that's, that was kind of, you knew that it was going to come up and, and the Soviet Union was going to collapse. It was just when. But to me, it's, it's, it's keeping an eye on that people power. 
And I would say that there's an important lesson for us today in that the same thing is happening today, but the spirit that we're seeing is different. We need to keep in mind that Mr. Erdogan, Mr. Orban, Mr. Kaczynski, uh, Mr. Trump, they are symptoms as much as causes. They are responding to political uh, uh, currents and, uh, and we need to understand why people's attitudes are now going that way rather than that way uh, and figure out w what's going on. Uh, Second point would, would be to highlight something that others have said today, and that is the importance of the U.S. Uh, I'm probably more pro-European than most people in this city. I think the European Union is one of the, the great accomplishments of our time. It's a revolutionary change in Europe, but it still needs our help. I think it was Margaret Thatcher who said, I like Germany so much that I always hope that there are two of them. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and I don't know whether, whether, uh, whether Germany would be reunited, reunited had it not been for the U.S. Uh, I look at Europe today, uh, it's hanging in there, but the Brits are leaving, no one's home in Berlin, Macron is trying, but it's tough, and, and they still need our help. Final point, uh, again one that's come out today, is, is the importance of a certain kind of American help. And that is what we call liberal internationalism, the marriage of power and partnership. And it took a long time for Americans to discover that. We tried in 1898 and it was mostly too much power. We tried in 1917 and it was too much partnership and idealism. And then finally FDR comes along and puts these two together and I think that Reagan and Bush did a great job of combining those two. They're now splitting. And that's in part because, as Paula said, the bipartisan compact behind that marriage of power and partnership is coming undone. It's leading to a very different kind of American engagement in the world that we all need to get our arms around and understand. Eric. Joel, thank you. It's great to be here. It's great to be on this panel um, with Paula and Charlie. Uh, although, I have to confess, I find myself slightly disoriented to be on Charlie's left. Um, <laughs> I like you there. <laughs> um, uh, and it's also uh, great to be part of this event commemorating, uh, you know, a, a hugely important event uh, in, in modern history and to be part of this with so many great people, uh, including Andy Card, who was chief of staff when I was working in the Bush 43 administration. It's really great to be part of this. Um, I guess the thing that I take away uh, most, particularly with all of the discussion of diplomacy and having spent uh, devoted 30 years of my life to the Foreign Service as an institution, um, is that uh, something I learned from one of my early mentors uh, in diplomacy who said, don't get vertigo because there are ups and there are downs and you cannot allow yourself to be thrown off by uh, the momentary high from uh, an event like the fall of the wall uh, because there are, although we frequently title diplomatic agreements the final act of this or that, there are no final acts in diplomacy. Uh, you're in the business of managing problems, managing the adjudication of national differences by non-military means, um, although military means are important to it. Um, and whatever problems you think you've solved, you've either pushed off to uh, you know, face them another day, uh, or you've created some problem along the way that uh, you're gonna have to solve in the future, or you've allowed new problems to arise that you hadn't paid attention to before that you're gonna have to solve. And so very quickly on the heels of this event that we're commemorating today, we found ourselves, for instance, dealing with the uh, problems really of the World War II, or excuse me, World War I settlement because we found ourselves dealing with uh, the breakdown of the former Yugoslavia uh, and because of uh, the war in Iraq, uh, we found ourselves dealing with the Middle East that was created by the World War I settlement. So here we were thinking we'd solved the big problems that had been created by World War II only to find ourselves re-engaging with the problems that had been created by World War I. And then just to pick up, uh, 
I think, uh, some comments that Paula and Charlie made. Um, I, I think it, it's very important, particularly as we consider some of the uh, totalitarian regimes or authoritarian regimes we're dealing with today, to remember that the reason we were able to get to the point of the wall coming down was, as Secretary Baker said, we'd had you know, bipartisan support for a number of years for the um, policy of containment, but towards the end, we had administrations that made it a point to force the Soviet Union to confront what I might have called in an earlier part of my life, the um, antagonistic contradictions that the system was based on. Mm -hmm. um, and only when that happened were we able to force Gorbachev and his colleagues to make a series of choices that led, as Charlie said, to the process getting out of, out of their control. Mm -hmm. The second point I would make looking forward from today is the problem we were wrestling with uh, in those years in the um, I started actually in the Carter administration in the Foreign Service, but in the Carter, Reagan, and Bush administrations, was a threat to democracy uh, largely from the left. And today, as Charlie was saying, the threat to democracy is largely on the right uh, from populist authoritarian regimes. It's a global problem, but it's particularly acute uh, in, in Europe and in Eastern Central Europe, uh, where it's become a particular problem and we can talk about some of the reasons for that. One of the things I think that was essential to US success in the Cold War was the role of liberal anti-communism. The fact that the center left in the United States agreed with the center right that certain parties in Europe were beyond the pale. They were beyond the pale because they had an allegiance to a, a foreign government um, and took assistance from that foreign government, and they were beyond the pale because they wouldn't agree to abide by the rules of democracy if they actually won an election. And the center left said, that is unacceptable, mm -hmm. and, and you can't be a participant in the international liberal order that we're creating if you go down that path. And I think it's incumbent on those of us who self-identify as on the center right today to take the same attitude to, to these movements that are arising that challenge the norms um, and uh, habits of democracy and are taking assistance from foreign powers. Well, let me ask you, and following up on that, look, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was tremendous euphoria that we had reached the end of history, the Liberal Democratic Project was largely accepted, the Cold Law looked like it was over, European unification um, was going to bring Eastern Europe into the fold of nations. And yet, as you, you know, now point out, um, we're starting to see deeply worrying regimes in Hungary and Poland and the Czech Republic um, in parts of the former East Germany. Um, we're seeing that sort of move to the right, a populism. It's surprising because the economic advantages of the integration for Europe have been tremendous, overwhelming even, and yet there's still this disquiet. Um, we have Russia yet rearing up. The Cold War competition um, seems to be regenerating. 30 years on, on, this fall of the Berlin Wall what, that was meant to really reintegrate um, and bring into the family of nations um, former rivals, uh, there seems to be fraying at the edges, to put it mildly, um, from all sides. Uh, what, what, are the, what are the implications of that? Why did we not understand and what did we miss when we thought of the euphoria after the wall of where we would get to at this current moment? And Let me start with you, Paul. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I was going to pick out uh, a couple of issues that I think have had bearing on these developments. And the first one is the lack of reform of the European Union. I pick that out uh, primarily because I hear constantly those from Central Eastern Europe talk about how they have been part of the EU but not really ever integrated uh, over basic issues, issues that have economic bearing to their respective countries. And so I think that part of this is, is interrelated with the way in which the EU has been operating. I think there is a need for reform. I think there's a need for greater flexibility. There's another component, too, that some that follow closely the, the, the uh, political trends have said that when particularly the center-left, as you were mentioning, were in power in place, that there could have been more inclusive approaches taken and maybe more coalition-oriented policies. And 
And there were certain lines that were drawn. And so then when the center left did not produce economically and center you know, right and the rightists came in, that there wasn't this kind of feeling of uh, camaraderie or uh, coalition building. And let me add the third and the last. It's interesting, you know, we equate, of course, the unificate, reunification of Germany with the fall of the wall. And also we think about the end of the Cold War. And it's interesting now at this time when people talk about Europe and where things are going, uh, Russia also looms large again in terms of what its agenda is. And there have also been concerns about that, not a causal relationship with your question, but I think it's also important to put that on the table uh, because uh, the the uh, the venue is not the one that was, and the feeling was not the one at the end of the uh, um, the fall of the wall and the end of the Cold War. Charlie, you agree? I, mean, I think the um, I, I broaden the lens a little bit in the sense that that it's it's right across. The, the, the Western world, that the populists are thriving. Uh, I think what's happening here and in Western Europe is, is pretty similar, and it's a combination of economic insecurity and identity politics, mainly in response to immigration that's created a toxic brew. Uh, and I think the US and the UK are particularly hard hit because we have two-party democracies. And so you got a lot of angry people out there and they really have two places to go. The Democrats or the Republicans here and they pull the parties to the left and right and the center left and the center right that Eric was talking about is being depopulated. Same thing has happened in the UK. Continental Europe's a little bit better because the angry people have other places to go. Alternative for Germany, the League, the national rally, and center left and center right are losing market share, but they're still in the center and generally in power. I think once we talk about Eastern Europe, it's a different kettle of fish because their economies have generally been doing well and they don't have any immigrants. So what the hell's going on there? Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's more about the success in some ways of these countries and the degree to which a more conservative, rural, religious segment of society has been politically empowered. Erdogan figured that out. Kaczynski has done it. Orban has done it. And they have manipulated uh, the anti-immigrant sentiment, particularly in, in East and Central Europe, to great political effect. Uh, quite blatantly, it, it has very racist uh, overtones. Uh, and it's worked. And, and I have to say, especially when we think back to the post-Cold War era, it's, it's quite distressing to me how susceptible our populations have been to this kind of anti-immigrant racist narrative. Simple truth is, it's working. Eric, any thoughts? I think um, it's been, I mean, these are really more or less footnotes to what Paul and Charlie are saying, but it's been, uh, I would say, the unequal distribution of gains uh, economically from globalization across a variety of, of uh, polities uh, that have led to a, a sense that uh, a large groups in, in various countries have been left out of what an elite has been able to benefit from. And in the European context, I think that's been exacerbated by the fact that the European project for some time uh, has had a huge disconnect between the Brussels-based multilingual elite that has benefited from it and from the populations at large. And it's not just in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, you see it in France, for instance, you know, as well. Um, and you see it in the, in the history of various referenda on various EU treaties where the principle of democracy has been to some degree subverted by the requirement that, you know, we vote on this until you get it right. Uh, by having multiple referenda on treaties that have been rejected by, mm -hmm. by national publics. So I, I think there has been a, a disconnect okay. uh, that has uh, affected things. And then I would just to add to what Charlie said about uh, migration, it's not, there, there have been a couple of waves of this, right? One was the fear of migration into Western Europe by the newly um, 
uh, uh, new members of the EU because of freedom of movement, mm -hmm. which created problems in uh, Central and Western Europe. Um, but then it was the failure uh, ultimately to uh, deal with both Libya and Syria uh, that set off a new wave of migration, both from Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East, that has made, I think, not just actual migration, but fear of migration as salient as Charlie just suggested. Well, I'm going to ask um, audience members who would like to ask a question to start lining up at this microphone here. And I'm also going to ask uh, Sam Donaldson if he can come back out again if anyone wants to ask questions about some of the pe uh, earlier things. But while, we're, while they're lining up, if I can ask you really just for a lightning round of, of, of a question regarding something that James Baker said. You know, he talked about the fraying alliances between the United States and Europe. He talked about his, his discussion um, with the German ambassador. Um, what do you think the possibilities are um, for the rubber band snapping back um, in a new administration um, of our relationship um, with our alliances and the transatlantic relationship in general? Can it sort of snap back or is some, some real permanent damage done um, in the 30 years um, uh, that we've built and forged that alliance and relationship? Just the thoughts about the, the flexibility of it moving back to a status quo ante. Quickly. Start with me. Uh, uh, briefly, I'm not sure that I would, in all cases, agree with that premise. Mm -hmm. um, let me give an example of NATO. Uh, NATO, all administrations have tried to get NATO to go with burden sharing. And the approach was a very hard-hitting one. My view is, actually, I think that NATO has moved forward in a very very already in a very important and substantive direction. There may be differences, but the agenda has been a very tough and forward-looking one. So I, I will, as I said, not necessarily agree sure. with the premise of the question. Charlie. I agree with the premise of the question. Uh, and <laughs> I think a lot of damage has been done. But I agree with Paula that there is a resilience to the transatlantic relationship, which we've seen here in Washington. Uh, Congress invited the NATO Secretary General for the first time in history to give a joint address. You look at public opinion in support of the alliance, it's exactly where it was under Obama. It's 75 to 76 percent positive. The, the thing that worries me is, are our allies over time going to get sick of us? Are they going to question our reliability? Are they going to see us go from here to there and back and, and say, this country doesn't know which end is up? Uh, and I think there's, that's starting to happen. Does that mean they're going to walk away from us? No, because there's no alternative. But I do think that it's going to take a lot of repair work uh, once we get over the next hump. The last word, just short. <clears throat> well, I think um, that there's been damage done uh, to Alliance Solidarity over the last two presidencies. Um, I think a lot of the rhetoric about burden sharing that we've heard from the current administration, we heard from the previous president, for instance, in his interviews with Jeffrey Goldberg, and I think there was already some building concern um, about it uh, in allied capitals. Uh, before the current administration came in, and I think as well the efforts to um, boost NATO spending uh, began before the current administration came in. I don't, they get some credit, but not all the credit for, for that in my view. I'm actually more concerned about the damage that's been done inside the United States government. Uh, if you're going to conduct diplomacy, you have to have a diplomatic instrument with which to conduct it. And I think there's been uh, very serious and lasting damage uh, to the career foreign service. Uh, I think we're going to find out more about that in the coming weeks. Um, and I would say that it's very easy to diminish uh, your capabilities in that area. It takes quite a long time to actually build them back up. And I, and I would say the same with regard to interagency processes. Uh, it's not, you know, it's like muscle memory. You know, if you lose it over a four year period, it doesn't just come back, or eight year period, it doesn't just come back and snap back to what it once was. Well, thank you. We're going to take questions from the audience. If you, if you could bring your question in the form of a question, we're going to take a few of them. Tell me who you'd like to address it to, um, and we'll keep the conversation going. Please. Thank you for this panel and this, uh, this event. And today, I feel very good to unite the world in East and West. And I think the best word I heard today is never lie. 
in the official office. And uh, probably this happened to be a problem if we don't do the right thing from within rather than just reach out the foreign services. Can I ask you for your question, please? Just a yes, question. My but question I'm is trying to say if we can do something right, like uh, in Reagan administration, we had such a good event for in Vietnam, Vietnam, but I think Reagan also used some bad advisors, or at least in his administration, they didn't use the well-qualified people. Instead, a lot of things happen that make our society bad. Yeah, right. So I just, just wonder if this panel can you, you your leadership, you don't lie and do the something to promote the good personnel, we can build a stronger society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I have the next question, please? First of all, thank you to our panelists. It's Ruben Blum, I'm a graduate student here at the School of Foreign Service. And I wanted to know if we could take any lessons from the fall of the Berlin Wall especially our American response to the fall of the Berlin Wall and apply it to other parts of the world. And I'm thinking in particular of Hong Kong today, another semi-autonomous region uh, with an upswelling of uh, support for independent way of life. And address this generally to the panel. Thank you. I'm going to get another question in. Thanks. Hi, Joanne Sears, Berlin American High School, class of 1987. Thank you for everyone for being here. This question goes directly to the um, United States, and this can go to Ambassador Dob Dobransky, how we kind of as a nation not focused on national security issues, specifically looking at the former Soviet Union and China um, as a threat when it comes to space issues. And do you believe that we kind of went we veered from the end of the, 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 Berl, the, you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall to more domestic policy issues, and that created sort of this vacuum of not watching adversaries like Russia and China, and it's led to a, a place where we are where we have a, a new space race happening right now when it comes to national security space, and I wanted to get your opinion on that. Thank you. Why don't we start with Paul, and then who wants to take the Hong Kong question? <laughs> I'll say a word on the Hong Kong question. I'm just going to do a footnote on the Hong Kong question. My, my answer is yes <laughs> uh, on that. I think there are a lot of lessons and application to what's happening in Hong Kong. I was in Australia, and the Australians are very engaged in this. And they cited the United States and actually uh, our approach, not publicly, but behind the scenes in helping the, the demonstrations taking place. So I, excellent question. With regard to space and uh, the United States and and, and Russia, um, you focus on a question that's key in foreign policy. There's been a lot of change regarding what the agenda is. Definitely, I think it's uh, agreed by those in the foreign policy community. There's bipartisanship around the fact that we are being challenged by China and we're being challenged by, by Russia. There is strategic competition. Um, so I'd even expand your question to not just Russia, but also China in this case. But there's what is is in, called the new frontier. There are issues of cyber, of uh, artificial intelligence, space, and one can go on, digital, in which there hasn't been the kind of focus that needs to be in terms of our preparedness and, uh, 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 and our own uh, investment in those areas. Um, interestingly enough, uh, in recent days, I think when Scott Morrison, and I'll wrap up Scott Morrison, <laughs> Uh, the Prime Minister of Australia was here. He contributed rather significantly to our program. This has become, a, in space, and this has become a top agenda item of this administration. Personally, I think it's important. I think you raise a key issue. These are topics that are now part of the discourse of what, what and how security, national security is defined. It's not traditional warfare of the past. Eric, <clears throat> you know, um, Charlie and I were talking about the uh, rise of authoritarian regimes. Paula touched on it as well. Um, and because of that phenomenon and in the wake of some of the, uh, you know, uh, dashed hopes uh, after the Arab Spring, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the democratic recession, which is a real phenomenon. It's been documented by Freedom House uh, and others. 
having said that, I think that's led a lot of people to conclude that democracy promotion and uh, you know, advocating for human rights uh, more broadly in our foreign policy is sort of passe. We shouldn't really do it anymore because no one really cares about it anymore. And I think what's going on in Hong Kong, what's been going on in Moscow, uh, what's gone on in Sudan and various other countries is actually an indication that the people who are having that debate are largely the ones who already enjoy the benefit of democracy. It's not going on uh, in those places where people are being denied the fruits of democracy. And I think if uh, either President Reagan or President Bush were here today, they would be wanting us to encourage uh, what is going on in, in Hong Kong and what's been going on in Moscow. Yeah. Two quick comments on Hong Kong. One, the main party that has drawn lessons from the end of the Cold War is China. And their lesson is, we're not going to let that happen to us. And that's, in my mind, one of the reasons that she is tightening things. And I'm kind of surprised he hasn't gone into Hong Kong in a more aggressive way. <clears throat> I'm with Eric <clears throat> on democracy promotion, but I think we have to do it steadily and patiently. We got it right during the Cold War. We outweighted them. They collapsed from within. Since the end of the Cold War, I think we've bit off more than we can chew. <clears throat> Trying to turn Iraq and Afghanistan into Ohio has not gone well. Uh, and so I think, I think let's, let's take the lesson from the Cold War as the right way to do it. Let me get some more questions. Uh, Glenn Williamson, SFS 83. Um, in regard to Russia and Germany, the question is, should the United States try and lead more from the middle? I mean, in, since 1989, those countries are both much stronger now than they were before. Is there a way to acknowledge that and to deal with them without, um, without trying to impose on them, but it somehow recognize that they are in a stronger position? Thank you. Next. Hi, my name is Hilary Kaba and I'm a senior at the SFS. So I was wondering, what are some of the things that the young generation can do in order to reaffirm the liberal democratic order and the democratic principles? Thank you. And one last, if it's quick, thanks. Good day, um, Piotr um, from the disunited kingdom. Um, but equally, I have a personal uh, relationship with the Berlin Wall because if my father hadn't come to the UK, um, I wouldn't exist. Um, so you could say from Russia with love that we, uh, we owe the Berlin Wall is, is quite pertinent. But my question, I think we're getting a general theme here that is there's lots of issues going on in the world that require Americans, in, uh, the US's input and its ally support. Um, and, but I think that the general theme I, I get my sense around is that what is the and what should be the United States grand strategy? Because we had a very clear one during the Cold War. Um, but in recent years we don't, I think, seem to have as clear cut uh, pathway, and I'd like Great. to hear your opinions on what that could be. Well, I'm going to start with Charlie because he teaches a course on grand strategy. So let's start with that, and the others Good. can jump in with other uh, to answer to other questions. I think the <clears throat> the top priority when it comes to grand strategy is to get our own house in order, because if the liberal anchor of the of the international system comes unglued which it might, we're kind of in, in the midst of, of that potentiality right now, then managing global change in this century is going to be very, very difficult. And we know that change is coming. The global distribution of power is shifting rapidly. The Atlantic community used to be about 80% of global GDP. We're now down below 50% and it will continue to shrink. So I would say the, you know, the top first, second, and third, fifth, sixth, seventh priority is to make sure that the liberal democratic world gets its mojo back. And the question from, uh, from what do we do? Get active. Get active. Get political. Uh, I'm struck by the degree to which in this country and everywhere else, yes, there are checks and balances, but they don't seem to work as well as we thought they would. And our main recourse is the ballot box. Get active. Paula. Uh, I would agree with that, by the way. In fact, in my class here at Georgetown, the MSFS uh, class, I'm delighted every single student is going into the Foreign Service. To me, that's also getting active. They're going into the diplomatic corps, but also there's one student who's running for state legislature in Michigan. And I, would, I have to say we were very impressed. So get active. That's our answer to you. On grand, on grand strategy, my view is I think that the tenets of our overall 
foreign policy have to be focused on the strategic competition and challenge posed by Russia and posed by China significantly now and in the future. As part of that, as Charlie said, uh, the moral narrative, uh, in other words, uh, the liberal order matters. There's been a complacency and there's a real need for uh, coming forward and ensuring that that moral narrative through the international liberal order is in fact maintained because it's being challenged by China, by Russia. So we have to uh, have that at the forefront of our framework of action. Yeah. Well, I completely associate myself with my colleagues' remarks about public service, and I encourage everyone here at the Georgetown School of Foreign Service to think about the problems I described earlier in the State Department as an opportunity. Um, on the grand strategy point, um, I, I think I, I agree largely with what uh, Paula and Charlie have said, but I would just add this. Um, I think there's going to need to be some uh, serious thought both on, the, on both sides of the aisle about what it takes for the United States to play the role in the world that we have played historically since 1945. Um, and that does mean getting our house in order, but getting our house in order, if you read the long-term uh, budget outlook of the CBO that comes out every year, means uh, that we have to get a handle on the entitlements problem. Entitlements is what's driving the long-term debt uh, problem. It's not the defense budget. I think my friends on the left need to understand that, as do some of my friends on the right who think that the 050 account is just another government budget account that should be cut like all the others. Um, you know, George Kennan um, gave a lecture after he wrote the long telegram in 1946 that I try and remind my Foreign Service colleagues of all the time. He said, you have no idea how much more uh, uh, cooperative and collegial diplomacy is if you have a little quiet power in the background. Um, and that's something I think we should remember as we think about diplomacy going forward. Well, as we talk about what to do now, I, I'm going to give the last word on this panel um, to Sam Donaldson about the role of the press in the current moment, given what he's seen in his career and his experience. Just the last word then. Be careful, Dean, because when you give me the bridle, I put it in my teeth in the southwest and I get the bit there and I run off, but I'll try not to do it. The role of the press is very difficult today, more difficult than when I was for 52 years operating here in Washington. And you know the difficulties, I don't have to go through them. But the press continues to try to do what I thought was its fundamental purpose, whether you're electronic or print or what have you. Uncover what you consider to be facts, a very elusive thing sometimes, and bring it to the American people. Because our democracy depends on the public weighing in. And getting the public weighing in is very hard today. It's not just the hard getting the facts, it's hard convincing the public that they ought to pay attention to them. Because when I first started in this town, there were three networks. You had to watch us. You had no VCRs. You couldn't watch a movie. I mean, no internet. And you did, because of the Cold War to some extent. Now, you kids get their information from Facebook and tweets and uh, uh, whatever. There's so many access points. So it's very difficult, but I think the thing to impress on people is, excuse me for being a partisan, we're not the American people's enemy. <laughs> we're not the enemy of that. We're enemies, if we have enemies, it's the enemy of things that are not true. And, and it's our job to continue to try and uncover them. How to get you to watch, not this audience. Oh yeah, hey, no problem, I say. You don't have to watch me, watch somebody else. Watch Tom Brokaw, but you will watch and you will read. How to get people who may have never left their state. Certainly, if you look at the number of passports available, even those that now required us to go to Canada and to Mexico on a passport for 19, uh, 2005, uh, you didn't have to have that. Very low compared to other countries in the world, not just Europe, but other places. How do we get Americans to travel? How do we get them to get their information from looking at it from reading about it, yes, but from looking at it and seeing it. Mr. Limbaugh may be a great source, but there are other sources. Uh, so the problem of the press today is to do its job. If someone says, no, you can't come down to the White House, you, you go to court, you come down to the White House. And if you say, well, no one's gonna tell you anything. Well, they may. And you have gotta be there in order to receive it if they do. And if they don't, 
Well, it's not an individual loss of the reporters, but it's a loss for truth and it's a loss for finding out what's going on. So I would just encourage everybody, young people I think who have a problem, they, some of them don't know anything about the press, but the others who do, they're activists. And I don't think people in this university have a problem of where to get their news, and what to read, what to listen to, and how to process it. But if any of you can come up with an idea, because we cannot make the American people, you have to watch this, you have to listen to me, you have to read this. No, <laughs> that's the worst way to get anyone to watch anything they go on television. If you can come up with a way to induce people to get interested in the facts, and then therefore in news organizations that will bring them the facts, Please see me. I'll, I'll, I'll nominate you for the Nobel Prize. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Sam. And let me, let me end by, first of all, thanking our panelists for an interesting discussion. Paul Dobriansky, Eric Edelman, Charlie Kupchin. Uh, thank you, Sam Donaldson. Um, and uh, let me turn the, the microphone over um, for the final remarks um, to Roger Zakheim, who's the executive director of the Reagan Institute, one of the sponsors for today. Uh, thank you so much. And everybody, please join me in thanking all the panelists to Georgetown University and all of you, all the students and guests. Of course, uh, thank you to our friends at the George and Barbara Bush Foundation. I think today's event, and I'm sure you'd agree, was a perfect first partnership for the Bush Foundation, the Reagan Institute, and we're looking forward to more collaboration in the future. And of course, thank you to Atlanta Council, to Dean Hellman, and to our moderator, the incomparable Sam Donaldson. Thank you so much. I, just a few more comments and then we'll close this out. But you know, the day the Berlin Wall fell, and I was a kid at the time, internalizing all of it from the TV at, in my uh, parents' living room, Sam's ABC News colleague, Peter Jennings, described the developments as, quote, perhaps the most important announcement made in Central Europe since the end of World War II, and certainly since the wall went up in 1961. And on that day, Americans knew they were watching history. We often remember, and we discussed this today, President Reagan's speech at the Brandenburg Gate as another defining moment on the path to the Soviet Union's demise. But in June 1987, it didn't seem that way at all. In fact, it hardly made news in America. It wasn't until the wall came down in 1989 that those four powerful words, tear down this wall, truly echoed around the world. And that's the nature of history. Sometimes you know you are witnessing it. Sometimes you only realize it years later. And looking back, it can all appear inevitable. We had that debate today. And therefore, almost unremarkable. But not even President Reagan or President Bush knew when the wall would come down or how the Cold War would end. But they did know it was a cause worth fighting for. And back in 89, on that day the wall fell, President Reagan joined one Sam Donaldson live on the air from his home in California. And this is a transcript, so please don't correct me because we got it off of the transcript service. The question was asked, do you think it would come down this soon? President Reagan responded, I didn't know when it would come, but I have to tell you, I'm an eternal optimist. I believed with all my heart that it was in the future. And maybe that's the most important lesson today. That like Presidents Reagan and Bush, we must always have faith that we can achieve a brighter future for freedom and humankind. Thank you all so much.